Hello, and welcome to the Atlantic Debrief, the Atlantic Council Europe Center's internet show and podcast on the most pressing issues impacting transatlantic relations today. I'm Susan Ness, non-resident senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council's Europe Center, and we're partnering today with our friends at the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. Our guest is Dame Melody Dawes, Chief Executive of Ofcom, the British regulator implementing the landmark Online Safety Act. An economist, Melanie Dawes joined Ofcom in early 2020, having served for more than 30 years in a variety of senior roles across the British civil service. Melanie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. You're visiting Washington, D.C. to discuss Ofcom's approach to implementing the OSA, which just received royal assent last month. This landmark legislation makes companies that operate a wide range of online services legally responsible for keeping people, especially children, safe online. As you know, on a prior Atlantic debrief, we hosted Richard Allen, one of the OSA's negotiators in the House of Lords, and he cited its long, twisting road to enactment. But after enactment, you hit the ground running. You immediately published Ofcom's approach to implementing the OSA, and two weeks later, issued your first consultation on illegal harms, draft guidance, and draft codes of practice. Please tell us briefly what the OSA is designed to achieve, the types of companies in scope, and how Ofcom plans to ensure that platforms and search engines comply. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, as you say, this is a really quite an exciting moment for us right now because we have new laws that uh, only kind of became law about a month ago when we've already gone out there with our first consultation. So the real work starts here of actually implementing this. What the bill is designed to achieve is um, it, it places a duty of care on um, platform services, companies that offer user to user or search services to UK uh, citizens. So that covers um, a, a lot of the big household names, um, obviously big uh, platforms like Instagram and TikTok, um, Google um, and Bard and so on, uh, but also quite a lot of smaller companies um, where there may well be risks and issues out there that also need to be addressed. So what we've asked in our first blueprint for change, which we published a couple of weeks ago, is really three things of the industry. Um, and they are, first of all, get your governance straight. Work out who's accountable for this. The laws apply to you if you serve UK citizens. Make sure that you've got systems in place uh, for decision making. Make sure your engineers are not just thinking about the commercial bottom line. They're also now factoring in safety considerations. Secondly, do a risk assessment. We've published a very comprehensive assessment of what causes harm online. And we are expecting companies to reference that and think about what applies to their services. There are many that will not be that risky. And we're not going to be asking for, you know, of a, um, a lot from everybody. But for those that do have risks, particularly to under 18s, we're expecting them to then think about our third expectation, which is that they introduce appropriate mitigations for their service to begin to address those harms that we're all concerned about. And our priority is, as you said, to protect children from some of the really horrendous crimes that can take place online, but also to protect the wider public from uh, fraud and terror um, as, as well. That's, that's the first set of work that we've uh, embarked on. That sounds like a, a very logical plan. Uh, and I was extraordinarily impressed with the work uh, that has been published to date. One of the descriptors says that you plan to have one-on-one -on -one, uh, supervision uh, so that you can better understand and mitigate future risks. How will that work exactly? And how do you achieve a level of trust with companies? And a lot of this is uh, brand new. How do you achieve a level of trust um, to have useful discussions um, rather than defensive responses, especially when the act itself assigns pretty heavy penalties for failure to comply? 
That's a really important question. And yeah, we do have as a regulator some, you know, heavy fines and penalties that we can impose up to 10% of global revenue uh, if we really think that's justified. But what we hope is that we won't get there with most companies. Um, and that's why we are investing in what we're calling supervision, which is a tried and tested concept in UK financial services regulation, which is really to get alongside uh, particularly the key companies where British kids and adults spend most of their time online and, and actually build a relationship and actually build that relationship of trust, get to know what's going on. And then, you know, if there are issues, you can move into a, a more formal compliance procedure. But for many companies, I would just say, work with us. We are independent. We are not a political body. We are based on the evidence. We have to stack up everything we do in court. So work with us. We are practical people. Um, we want to build a strong working relationship with you and we think that this is doable. We think we can make a difference here while still supporting innovation and investment in these critical sectors. Uh, within the Act, there are inherent conflicts between protecting online safety and protecting data, protecting the right to privacy, freedom of expression. How do you balance these mm. competing interests? Mm. Yeah, well, I think these are um, these are, this is just a reality that, you know, when you're making decisions that you want to introduce a new uh, set of actions to prioritize safety, of course, we do need to think about freedom of expression, free speech, and also privacy. You're absolutely right. Now, Ofcom, like many regulators, including in the US actually, has by law to balance these things already. So we have duties to promote also investment and innovation and growth as well, actually, but also to prioritize freedom of speech because it's in British law as in other European countries' law that we can only intervene as a public body to curtail freedom of speech if there's due reason. So we have to stack that evidence up and we are very used to doing that in a number of our, um, a number of the, the areas we've worked on over many years. When it comes to privacy, I think that's particularly important when we come to online safety, and we may get into some of this, but um, we're working very closely with the UK's data protection body, the Information Commissioner's Office, and they are hand in hand with us, looking at all our work with us before we do it, as we do it, so that we can really be sure that when we're making proposals, we're not actually harming what are quite strong data and privacy protections in British law. I know during the debates in Parliament, there was a lot of concern about whether companies would have to scan encrypted messages uh, for terrorism and uh, child sexploitation. And some companies even uh, were threatening to withdraw from the UK. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, how you're addressing the issue of encryption and do they have to worry about uh, that going forward? Mm -hmm. So there's no requirement in the Act for companies with end-to-end -end encrypted services to break that encryption or to scan within an encrypted environment. And I think there was a lot of debate about this. Um, but that was for good reason, because actually what the Act does say is that encryption can increase risk. So unfortunately, an encrypted environment can be a really great place for perpetrators of crime to share, for example, images of children being abused. So what we are going to say, what we are saying to companies is, if you have encryption, it doesn't remove the duty of care. So what you're going to need to do is talk to us about what other mitigations, and I think there are quite a few that you can put in place that don't actually break that encrypted environment, which is not something that we either want to do or are required to do. Longer term, I hope there will be technology that increases our ability to manage these risks. Um, but to be very clear, there's no requirement to break encryption or to scan in, in those environments from our new laws. Another issue is the conflict between age assurance and the right to privacy. Tell us how you plan to ensure that underage children are protected. Mm -hmm. Well, our parliament's been very clear here that particularly when it comes to um, adult content and particularly pornography, there must be what the bill says is highly effective age assurance at aged 18 to make sure that under 18s can't stumble across that material in the way that I'm afraid today they really can. And we published research last week at Ofcom, actually, sorry, this week, um, we published a lot of research, um, which uh, just shows, I'm afraid, that, that British kids are watching pornography, uh, as they are, I'm sure, in the US and elsewhere, in a way that 
massively concerns parents. So there is huge support amongst the public for tackling this. Now, the question then is how? But this is where, as a regulator, we just get very practical. So next week, we will be coming out with guidance for pornography providers, commercial providers, on how to meet that test of highly effective age assurance. And we're not going to say you've got to follow this method or another method, but we will set out five or six systems that we believe do preserve privacy, things like using other mechanisms you may already have, like a digital identity wallet, to just give a yes, no answer when you're entering an adult environment as to whether you're over 18 or not. There are plenty of solutions out there, we believe, that don't breach data privacy laws um, and that can be put in place um, effectively in order to make sure that kids basically can't go online into places which we would never allow them offline in the real world. Tell us how Ofcom is working with other regulators, uh, both within the UK as well as regulators uh, around the globe on these common issues. Uh, I've been very impressed with uh, your plans in that direction. Mm. Yeah, it's such an important area of work for us. And I think, you know, many countries are thinking about how do we you know, regulate uh, for the digital age. And, you know, the growth of amazing online services does raise issues for competition. We have a lot of, you know, or rather a few companies that are quite dominant globally in certain markets. It also raises questions for data privacy, uh, given the centrality of data to the business model in the online age, and also safety, of course. Um, and so what we've done in the UK is invest in a collaboration across the key digital regulators, the competition, the privacy, Ofcom, also our financial conduct authority, so that we can pool our resources. And we're finding um, that that is really helping us both if you like, at a strategy lens to look ahead, things like AI, Gen AI, metaverse and new technologies and what that might mean. But also, actually, we sit down and talk about individual services from time to time. We, we, we share uh, through our information gateways. And that's quite useful, too, when it comes to compliance and enforcement. So we made a decision as leaders in those organizations to invest in that. And it has proved to be incredibly helpful three years later. But the international angle is also so important for us. We've established a network of online safety regulators, which includes Australia, Canada, France and Germany and Ireland and a few others coming on stream. Because what we want is to you know, have common standards where it makes sense. Um, we don't want to be uh, requiring the industry to all follow slightly different protocols when actually we can do the same thing. So where possible, we want to achieve harmonization and common standards and work together globally as well. That's so vitally important because more and more we're beginning to see a regulatory tower of Babel yeah. as uh, so many of these mammoth regulations are coming online in a number of different countries. Um, uh, prior to the uh, enactment of the OSA, even, even as it was progressing during Parliament, uh, we saw the um, Digital Services Act come into force uh, in the European Union. Can you give me a sense of how these are similar, how they differ, how what lessons, for example, you've learned from the implementation of the DSA uh, and, and how you see that going forward? Mm. Yeah, so the, the Digital Services Act is very much a regulatory cousin, really, of the Online Safety Act in the UK. And I think you would expect that given our incredibly long tradition of partnership and indeed common approach to policy policymaking uh, that's been built up during the time that Britain spent in the European Union. So um, the, the two acts have at their core the same approach, a duty of care and a requirement to put in place systems and processes. So a principle that it's not about particular content decisions that the regulator will make. It's not about taking down or requiring particular decisions on actual posts or anything. It's about do you have adequate content moderation? Are you thinking properly about um, how user complaints work and how flagging can work, where, whether it's a risk of fraud or of terror and hate material? So we have a lot in common in, the, in principle, but there will also be some differences in practice. So at a political level, um, I think our parliament has prioritized things like child grooming more than in the European framework. So we expect to work very closely in partnership, but also I think you'll see some differences, maybe a little bit of competition amongst the two systems. Um, but Britain is an important market for 
online global companies. And so uh, I think, you know, we have a lot that we're going to be able to achieve through what Ofcom is, is now embarked upon. Do you have any final message? Uh, you've been here in the United States, you've been meeting uh, on the Hill, you've been meeting with folks within the government. Um, what, um, what messages both have you received and are uh, you conveying here in, in the United States? Mm. Well, look, every time I come to Washington, and I try and come about every six months or so, um, it, it, it's a slightly different conversation. And, and it's interesting that this time around, it is moving on. I think there's a real appetite to address some of this um, in the US. Um, and when I look at the research on what parents and kids think in particular about online safety, there's no difference really between US parents, US kids, and what you'll hear when I, as I do frequently go and talk to um, particularly young people about their experience experiences online. I think people just want to be more in control of what's going on. They want to be able to tailor their experience more. Um, when I speak to young people, they don't want to be blamed when something goes wrong. They want their parents to be alongside them and to listen to them. But I would say um, in the context of the US debate, you know, I do believe that a lot of what is needed doesn't engage freedom of speech. Um, we have proposed, for example, uh, that one of the best ways to protect kids from predators online is just not to have them visible um, and be recommending uh, them as, you know, as an appropriate contact for adults they don't even know, not to have their friends and family visible to strangers who may happen to be on the same platform but aren't in their network. And, and if you think about it, who would possibly think that it was right for your kids' details to be freely available to anybody in the world? Of course, privacy is needed there and, and that increases safety too. So a lot of this is not uh, I believe, quite so central to a free speech debate as I think is sometimes a concern in the US context, which I do understand, but I think we can practically find some ways forward here that do achieve progress. And, and indeed, what you're talking about right now really is a whole of society becoming engaged in understanding uh, the risks involved and participating in, in the solutions, which uh, is always good for a healthy democracy. I think that's right. The internet age is here. You know, our young people in particular, and I have a, a daughter who's who's 20, you know, they've grown up with, with social media. And I think for many of us, it's, it's, it's very new, um, uh, particularly somebody, you know, for me. I mean, I did not grow up with this myself. But, you know, it's here to stay. It can bring huge benefits, but we do need to regulate it and we do need to achieve some change if we're to get those benefits. And of course, you know, people who are experiencing a really bad time being trolled and harassed and abused on time, they haven't got much freedom of expression because the risks are too great of going out there and sharing their opinions online. So I do think there are huge benefits from cleaning this up a bit. Um, the accountability has to be with the companies themselves. And that's what Ofcom is going to be trying to drive through. Wonderful. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you, Dame Melanie. We really appreciate your coming and visiting with us today.